subscribe to LearnCab and hit the bell icon to get notified. Okay, let's start with it. So the whole idea of defining what is supply can be related to a bucket discussion. That's what I'm going to do now. Okay, so we are at chapter supply. There are a lot of activities that is happening in India. What's the taxable event for the purpose of GST? It is supply. So I need a bucket called as supply bucket, which is tagged as supply. A lot of activities are there. Lot of transactions are there in India. To give you an example, right now I'm, I'm doing an activity. I'm delivering lectures. You're sitting and watching. There is uh, your mother must be right now cooking. Okay. So your father would have gone to your office, their offices, or they would have gone for some work. You probably somebody is purchasing something. Okay. Somebody is eating something. There are a lot of activities that is happening. The whole idea of this particular chapter or this section is to discuss can that activity be called as a supply? If that activity cannot be tagged as a supply, assume that that activity that I am discussing now by anal analyzing this particular provision, I could not call it as supply. What will be the implication of that? If I fail to call that activity or transaction as supply, what will be the implication of that? Will I be will I be able to collect GST ever? An activity I put into the test of section 7. Section 7 came out and said, it's like a factory. I Section 7 uh, gave you the result by putting into that test. Okay. The result was not a supply. Will I be able to collect GST on that? The answer is no. Because the moment it is not a supply, you will not be able to collect GST at all. This is the understanding that first you need to have. That is why I said we are more interested in knowing what is not a supply rather than knowing what is a supply. Are you following what I am trying to tell you? Now, what will be the intention of the government here? I want you to tell me what is the intention of the government. I told you that an ideal taxation system should have a wide tax base. Right? What do you mean by wide tax base? Maximum goods and services should be under the taxability. So if I am expecting maximum items to be under the taxability or maximum items should be subject to GST. What kind of what kind of bucket I will create? Will I create a very big bucket wherein I will include everything inside that? Or I will I keep, it a, keep a narrow bucket wherein only few items will be a supply? Wide or narrow? Wide or narrow? I will create a very wide bucket. So you can see all the definition that has been added in here, all the definitions that we have. Throughout what they have tried to do is to include everything under supply definition. You guys with me? So the whole idea of this section seven is to bring a check on activities and transaction happening in India and then giving it a tag or putting it in the bucket called as supply. So the moment I put something on the supply bucket, then there is a chance that I will collect GST from that. So the moment I will put a check on supply, the answer comes as yes. But the answer comes as no. Then I can outrightly say no GST at all. The answer is no, no GST at all without any doubt. I don't need to even bother. If the answer comes as yes, Then I have to check another question. I have to ask another question. Is it a taxable supply or is it exempted supply? Or rather I'll ask the question, is it an exempted supply? If the answer is no, if the answer is yes, 
then again no GST. If the answer is no, then GST is payable. This is how I'll make a decision. Supply will not give me, supply will not give me complete understanding. Supply will not give me complete understanding. It will not give me 100% understanding. Rather, it will give you an understanding on whether an act, whether an activity or transaction is supply or not. The moment it becomes supply, you, you're putting it into another check. Call it, is it exempted? If it is exempted, then there is no GST. But if it's not exempted, then GST is payable. Exemption is only certain items. So, but if it is outrightly not a supply, no GST at all. Now, how the supply section has been defined? It is defined over a very big structure. Reason, government do not want to leave out any chance. Government wants to ensure wherever possible, I should be able to collect GST. This is the whole idea that the government has. So, their provision can be understood like this. So, Section 7 of CGST Act defines what is supply. Section 7 has how many subsections? There are four subsections it has. Subsection 1. I am going to give it a name for. See, I want you to have a relationship with the sections. I have a good relationship with the section. I like the section. I am calling it in some pet names. I talk to them. And they talk to me. They should do the same with you. They are good people. Only thing you have to approach it like that. Section 7 defines what is supply. Section 7 has four subsections. It's like a family. Four subsections. Four kids. And each of them has a purpose. Subsection 1. What is the name that we have given for that? We have called it inclusion subsection. The name that we have given is inclusion subsection next is subsection one capital a so the moment you see a capital a inside a section what is the assumption that you should be making in your head you should be saying ha ah, this could be some amendment right okay so this is an amendment has come long back but only there was no change in section only for better clarity they have removed it from subsection one and created as a separate subsection one capital a we're calling it as deemed supply of goods or services. Multiple places we're using the term deemed. Okay, but then I'll differentiate between all of those. Subsection 2, I'm calling it a name, exclusion subsection. This fellow talks about exclusion. Like subsection 1, that fellow talks about inclusion. Subsection 3 is empowering government. Subsection 3 is empowering government to do something. So how many subsection? Four subsection one, one a, two, and three. Let's look at what a subsection one says. Subsection one has subsection one has three clauses. How many clauses? Three clauses. Clause A. What's the name that we're going to call for clause A? Clause A is called as general definition. Clause A is called as general definition. What does that general definition mean? What does the general definition mean? General definition means generally what is called a supply. It's a very simple understanding. I'm just calling, calling it as general definition. There is no word called general definition inside the act. I'm just calling it as general definition because I want to have a relationship with that. So if you ask me section 7, subsection 1, clause A, it defines what exactly is supply generally. It says that there are four pillars. There are four pillars that is required for an activity to be called as supply. Or rather it says if you are doing some activity or transaction, take that activity. Put it and ask that question to that activity. Do you satisfy four conditions? If you satisfy all four conditions, then I will call you as supply. If there is a chance, I will collect GST from you. You guys with me? Okay, so there are four pillars for an activity to be called as supply. What is the first one? Supply should be supply of goods or services or both. First pillar is these are all the pillars that we have. First pillar is supply should be supply of goods or services or both. Second one, supply should be for consideration. Third one, supply should be made by a taxable person. 
Fourth one, supply should be in the cause or furtherance of business. How many pillars? There are four pillars that is required for an activity to be called as supply. First one, supply should be supply of goods or services or both. Supply should be for consideration. Third one, supply should be made by a taxable person. Fourth one, supply should be in the course of furtherance of business. Only if all the four conditions are satisfied, I would call an activity to be supply. So I will make the check whether all these four, when somebody is making a supply, so you are uh, you are going to a restaurant and the restaurant is giving you food. Are you supplying goods or services or both? They said yes. Is he paying consideration for that? Yes. Uh, is that is that particular restaurant a taxable person? Yes. Is this activity happening in the course of furtherance of business in India? Yes, it's a part of business activity in India. Then it's a supply. Collect GST from that particular activity. From whom should I collect? Generally, you get it from the supplier or restaurant. I'll get it. Restaurant. How can I how can uh, I pay the taxes? I wanted to collect it from the consumer. Okay, shift the burden to the consumer, then consumer pays it ultimately. This is how the whole structure is built. Are you guys understanding this? Okay. Now out of these four pillars, everyone, you should be very clear on four pillars. It should be goods or service or both. Consideration should be there, taxable person in the course of furtherance of business. Out of these four pillars, two of them, two of them are going to be called as core pillar what's the term i'm going to use core pillar core pillar what do you mean by core pillar out of this i've already numbered it which are the ones consideration and business objective supply should be for a consideration supply should be in the course of furtherance of business these two are called as core pillars of supply why am I calling it as core pillars? Because no transaction or activity can ever be a supply if both consideration and business is missing in that transaction. No transaction can ever be a supply if both consideration as well as business is not there. This is the easiest way of remembering it. Can there be activities where there is there cannot be any consideration and any business? Can there be activities where there are no consideration or business? Can there be activities where there are no consideration, no business? Put it on the chat box. Give me an example. Yes, which is the activity? That activity has no consideration. That is having no business, but they are supplying goods. They are supplying services. Can there be any supply where there is no consideration? Yeah. The one is correct answer, gift. Charity. I give a gift. No consideration. No business. Lot of activities. I will give you another activity. Your mother is giving you food. If you go to a restaurant, will that be called as a service? Yes. Your mother is giving the same dosa, better, tastier. Is there any consideration for that? Amma, 10 rupees for your dosa. No. Then, is, there, is that her business? No. Now, no transaction can ever be a supply if both consideration and business is missing. So, can this particular activity of can this particular activity of can this particular activity of mother giving food be called as a supply and GST be collected? No, that's impossible. No, that's not correct. So if both consideration and business is missing, it can never be a supply. But what if what if one is there, other is not there? Which means 
what if there is a supply where there is consideration but there is no business objective or what if there is a supply it is in the it is for business but there is no consideration can those be a supply very carefully listen an activity can be a supply only if all the four conditions are satisfied if even one of them is missing generally it cannot be a supply but if both consideration and business is missing it can never be a supply this is the order in which we are going okay all four well good and supply in that anything is missing not a supply but consideration and business is missing it can never be a supply but if consideration is there business is missing similarly business is there in consideration is missing sometimes some activity which are only specified and government notified those activities sometimes can be a supply how that can be a supply this is what has been dealt in clause b and clause c clause b says importation of services for consideration with or without business objective can be a supply similarly clause c says activities mentioned in schedule 1 without consideration in the course of furtherance of business that can also be a supply are you guys understanding so clause b and clause c are talking about this two aspect of consideration and business objective in clause b how do you remember this in clause b b is missing in clause b b is missing which means that business is missing in clause b b is missing means business is missing so what is there consideration is there business is missing consideration is there so importation of services for consideration without business objective can also be a supply now you if you logically analyze okay let's go back to our bucket discussion we logically analyze and then look at this bucket and then we make a decision by by checking four aspects and i checking on checking on whether all the four aspects are correct whether all four aspects are correct i have added so many activities into this bucket i have added so many activities now is the government satisfied with it i mean say no we add more how will we add can we say that all the four out of all the four can we say that business and uh, consideration is not required for an activity to form supply no no that we cannot say if both of them are missing that activity looks like it cannot be subject to gst look at it mothers making food i cannot collect gst on that there is no consideration of business but then what about business is not there but consideration is there that also does not look but there is one activity which i want gst which is that activity they said importation of services importation of services with consideration whether you have business or whether you don't have business it can still be a supply i'll give you an overall understanding on this when i'm taking 71b in detail similarly clause c what it says in clause c it says schedule one activity in clause b what is missing business is missing what should be there consideration should be there what activity can be a supply importation of service similarly in clause c what is missing consideration is not there okay is there is there a business objective yes what activity without consideration generally will an activity be a supply no because consideration is not there but some activities which are specified in schedule 1 those activities alone what's your understanding generally consideration is not there it cannot be a supply but if business is there consideration is not there certain activities four activities are there which are mentioned in schedule 1 that becomes a supply again are you understanding this so so again if you go back to the bucket i initially had the bucket filled by section section 7 1 a generally how many conditions four conditions then i said okay i will add something more 7 1 b importation of services no problem business is not there consideration is there i'll add it plus i'll add something from 7 One C consideration is not there. Schedule one, I'll add you also. So I'm actually increasing the tax base again. Are you guys with me? That is why section seven one in all section one seven one sections, I'm talking about what is going to be included in supply. So I'm going to call this as inclusion subsection. Now, what is one A? 
Now it's called, it's called as inclusion subsection. What is 1A? Deemed supply of goods or services. 1 capital A, 1 capital A is deemed a supply of goods or services, which means activities or transactions which are supplied by subsection 1 will be treated as either supply of goods or supply of services by schedule 2. Deemed a supply of goods or services means activities or transaction which are supplied by subsection 1 treated as supply of goods or supply of services by schedule 2. I'll tell you the logic of it. Very interesting logic. Question. Assume that section 1 and subsection 1a. Assume that section 1 and subsection 1 capital A, both of them are subsection 1 and 1 capital A, both of them are uh, people. I went to subsection 1, I asked them, I went to subsection 1 and asked them, Hey, subsection 1, what is that you will tell me? Subsection 1 said, I'll tell you whether you are a supply, whether it should be included in supply or not. Now, subsection 1A, I went to subsection 1A, I was like, hey, subsection 1A, will you also tell me whether I am a supply? Subsection 1A said, no, no, that's not my agenda. What's my agenda then? Subsection 1A says that you go and ask first subsection 1. Go and ask subsection 1. What is the question that you have to ask? Question that you have to ask to subsection 1 is whether you are a supply. If the answer is yes, then you come to subsection 1A. After it is after it is a supply, then you come to subsection 1A. Ask whether you are supply of goods or you are supply of service. This is what you should ask. Are you guys understanding this? So subsection 1 gives you whether it is a supply or not. Subsection 1A does not talk about that. Subsection 1A talks about what? Subsection 1 capital A talks about whether after it becomes a supply, is it supply of goods or is it supply of service? Why we need to differentiate between supply of goods and supply of service? Perfect answer. Different tax rates. Because I cannot stop by saying it is just a supply. If it was just one rate across, I could have said it's a supply, whatever charges you get, pay GST. Now, I have different rates for goods, different rates for services. Thereby, after I understand it is a supply, I should also understand whether it is supply of goods or supply of services. So, subsection 1A gives you clarity. They said, I'll, I, my job is very simple. After you, after one will tell you that you are a supply, you come to me. I will tell whether you are a supply of goods or supply of services. Are you guys with me? Okay. So, different sections have different purposes. Subsection 1 capital A gives you understanding to pick the rate, whether I should check HSN table, whether I should check SAC table, what is the table that I have to look at. Then, subsection 2, what is the name that we have for subsection 2? Exclusion subsection, that's the name, exclusion subsection. Now, subsection 2 exclusion subsection has two clauses, clause A and clause B. Clause A talks about negative list. Clause B talks about notified case, cases of exclusion from supply. Now let's go back to our bucket discussion. What did I do? I have, what was the intention in my mind when I was defining what is supply? My intention was very clear. I wanted to include maximum items under supply. But when I decided to do that, my bucket became too wide. <laughs> Okay, it became too wide that it gets cut, right? I don't want that much of white. Like there are certain activities government found. They have no intention to collect GST, but it became supply by subsection 1 because their definition was including maximum items. So what they decided? From this bucket, they decided I'll throw out something. Even though this is supply by your definition in subsection 1, I don't want these items to be inside this. So this they added section 7. Subsection 2 exclusion. First thing they have created a list called as negative list in close A, wherein they said, I will pick out the activities which are not a supply. I'll mention in schedule 3. So even though it can be having consideration, business, and everything, it is still not a supply because I'm excluding it. Okay, this is one. 
also i said hey government why why subsection one i made even your activity is supply i'm really sorry even your activity becomes a supply but government i'll give you something i'll give you a power to notify that your activity wherever it is not a supply now there is a very important difference between notification and circulars in your indirect taxes or any taxes or any law that assets that you take you will have two things to learn something called as notification another one is called as circular circulars and notifications now what is the difference between circulars and notifications notifications will be allowed only in those sections where government is permitted to notify okay now let's try to understand the structure there are sections where sections are part of the act where where did we pass the act we passed the act in parliament so any changes to the act ideally should go to the parliament but then parliament sees that see do you think the purpose of parliament is to run gst law no right there are multiple laws in the country that is to be discussed in the parliament so they say there are things which can be decided by the government itself i don't want you to come to me every time so what is it the parliament will do parliament will delegate its power parliament will put it in a section saying that in this section government you make a decision don't come to me government will be empowered to notify there so according to that section there will be notification coming in are you following but what is a circular circulars are only clarifications so circulars are like departments telling you what is that they meant by a section that's the understanding of circular so that's why we generally call circulars as clarificatory circulars so can i change a section by using a circular not possible it can only be used to tell what is that that they meant say when the section came in there will be different corners different people reading the section and interpreting for their benefit but then ram says no 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 that's what that's not what i meant okay so i would like to clarify this particular provision that this is the way in which you should understand understand this particular provision that is circular so in section 7 sub section 2 close b what is that they have allowed government to do government hey government you can notify what is that you can notify activities of government or local authorities as public authority as not a supply you can notify these as not a supply but upon recommendation of gst council so gst council can recommend and then government can notify whose activities government or local authorities activities as public authority and they can tell that this is not a supply then clause 3 that is why we are calling it as ex exclusion subsection now clause 3 uh, sorry subsection 3 is empowering government here also they have we have used the word activities or transaction can be notified so this also is giving the government power to notify it what is that they can notify it as they can notify an activity as supply of goods see they are just clarifying by notification that see these activities are supply of goods not supply of service or these are supply of service that not supply of goods this is what is the power that is given in section 7 sub section 3 so this gives you an overall understanding of supply section so what is that you should do after we finish the supply chapter you should be able to look at this notes along only these notes and then you should be able to make a decision ha huh. so uh, my understanding has to be very clear my understanding has to be very clear it has to be like okay when i look at subsection 1 i should be able to remember everything that is further discussed like subsection 1a i should be able to remember schedule 2 2 i should be able to remember what are the items in schedule 3 so the entire revision should happen by looking into one slide like this are you guys understanding can i have a yes on the chat box perfect now let's look at the first one section 7 sub section 1 clause a 7 1 clause a okay so what is clause section 7 sub section 1 clause a talks about it talks about general definition of supply i have given you the bare act definition also through this chart i have given all of it it's just one chart we will learn the entire section now i'm going to read the section and you have to read it together with me in the order in which i'm reading it as a sentence general definition starts with the word supply includes you can see on the top supply includes and look at the first branch all forms of supply of goods or services or both jump to the second branch such as 
then look at the branch under that sale transfer barter exchange lease license rental disposal made or agreed to be made for a consideration by a person in the course of furtherance of business again you know how to read the section now the bare act says a very simple wording it says general definition 7 1 it says supply includes all forms of supply of goods or services or both such as sale transfer barter exchange lease license rental disposal made or agreed to be made for a consideration by a person in the course of furtherance of business very important what type of definition is this is it an exhaustive def definition or is it an inclusive definition are they trying to make it wide by making it an inclusive definition the answer is this is an inclusive definition as you can see they have even started with the wording supply includes they, they did not use the word supply means right so they have they are trying to make an inclusive definition now we will have to look at each of it and then try to understand what will be generally included in supply we already know this from this definition only i have taken out four pillars to the supply like supply should be supply of goods or services of both it should be for consideration it should be made by a taxable person it should be in the course of furtherance of business all of this i have taken like you guys with me okay now first branch what is the intention what is that we are trying to understand here we are trying to understand that supply should be all forms of supply of goods or services of both okay we are trying to understand supply should be supply includes all forms of supply of goods or services of both it has a wordings like that what is the meaning of it it means that if i can if i can call an activity as supply of goods or supply of services there's a chance that it can be a supply but what if i find out an activity which is neither goods nor services i can say that it cannot be a supply because supply has to be all forms of supply of goods or services of both so our intention is that to find out fetch items which are not a supply from these particular sections so the first condition is or the first feature is supply should be supply of goods or services of both for that we need to understand what do you mean by goods what do you mean by services what is neither goods nor services clear now let's look at this they have defined what is goods what is service all the definitions are in section 2 do you remember do you have to remember the subsections of uh, section 2 to write it in the examination i don't think it's mandatory for you to remember because you have so many act to learn like you have income tax act companies act all that act that you are looking at so the moment you started pushing a lot of sections inside your head if it is getting confused for you if you think it's not possible for you to do don't stress yourself don't write a wrong section in the examination it is okay you write as per section 2 if you don't remember that also all the definitions are section 2 not not a problem but if you don't remember that also you write as per the relevant provisions of cgst act and rules there on like a common word and then still you can write the correct sections or correct provisions that's sufficient for you to do let's look at the definitions what do you mean by goods we are going to read it i'm going to read it you are going to read it on the screen as well goods are every kind of mobile property goods are every kind of mobile property it includes actionable claims growing crops grass and things attached to or forming part of the land which are agreed to be seeded before the supply goods are every kind of movable property it includes actionable claims and growing crops grass and things attached to or forming part of the land which are agreed to be seeded before the supply it excludes money and securities this is the definition of goods we will try to understand each one in detail goods are every kind of movable property every kind of movable property which means whether immovable properties are goods the answer is no now what do you mean by movable property you have to go back to the old definition of movable property which says whatever i can bring it to the market and then sell it from the market will become movable your building will it be movable no but whatever is fit in just by nut and bolt like your fan 
Is it a mobile property? Yes, your switchboard, is it a mobile property? Yes, these are all available. Right now it's just fit into the uh, immobile property, just nut and bolt, will not be making it immobile. These are all mobile. But your building cannot be brought to the market and installed, it is immobile. There's understanding it. So, goods are only mobile property. But immobile property, can I outrightly say that immobile property will not be subject to GST? No, I have to look at the definition of service as well. Is there any service relating to immobile property that can be subject to GST? I'll have to check that as well. Which also includes actionable claims. Now, when you don't understand a word, you will have to understand the definitions. You will have to understand the examples of it. If you're getting confused on the definition. So I want to give examples of actionable claims. Your actionable claims includes unsecured debt, betting, gambling, lottery, etc. Now the important part here is that multiple definition of goods excludes multiple definition. Wherever we have definition of goods, it excludes it excludes goods from it excludes goods from the part of it excludes goods from uh, or it, it excludes actionable claims from the definition of goods but in gst they, they were, we do an opposite we're saying that goods i want to call actionable claims also as goods what would be the intention they want to collect gst that simple it is so they said even even actionable claims are good so your unsecured debt betting gambling all that will be called as goods even growing crop, grass and things attached to a forming part of the land which are agreed to be severed before the supply. This is a common thing that is there in every goods definition which says that if there is a crop right now, coconut, it is right now is, is there on the coconut tree. But can I call it as immovable at this point? No, when you are supplying you will cut it. So it is movable only. But it excludes, very important part, it excludes money and securities. What do you mean by money? Money can be currencies. Points, all of them are not goods. They are not considered to be goods. Which means that I give you two thousand rupee notes, and you give me four five hundred rupees notes. Can I can I can I tell that you have supplied me goods? No, you have supplied me money. Money is not goods. But you have given me an old currency, the twenty paise, and I have given you two thousand rupees. Will that be considered to be supply of goods? Yes. So even though money is not goods. If the money gets numismatic value, means the money gets the measure because of its archaeological value and money generally when will I call something as money because it derives the value from what is written on the face of it. 10 rupee is 10 rupee because it is written on the top of it as 10. But the moment 20 paise gets me 2000 rupees, then this 20 paise is not considered to be money. Gold going, not money. It gets its value from some other measure, not from what is written on the face of it. Securities, securities are also not goods like shares, debentures, etc. Now, but money and security, I cannot outrightly say it is not subject to GST. I'll have to also analyze is there any service relating to money and security. So, we'll have to go ahead and then read the definition of service also to get a conclusive understanding on all of this. And service is anything other than goods, security, and money. But in when you look at service definition, you can see that. Even though they have excluded services, anything other than goods, other than security, other than money. But they said something relating to security and money, I'm including back. First one, like, let's look at money. They're saying service includes use of money, exchange of currency or denomination where separate consideration is charged. What do you mean by separate consideration? You can remember it as commission. Say, the same transaction I told you earlier, I gave you 2000 rupees, you are giving me 4 500 rupees notes. But you are charging 10 rupees commission for that. That 10 rupee commission will become subject to GST. Then this exchange of, if there is a separate consideration I am getting for that. Okay, you are charging me 10 rupees, so you are getting 10 rupees extra, which is a separate consideration for this transaction of exchange of money. You are giving me dollars and I am giving you rupee and you are charging me commission for that then that particular exchange of money will become a service that commission part alone will be subject to gst then securities there's an explanation that is inserted by amendment act which says service includes facilitating transaction in security let's look at an example
State Bank of India did an IPO. State Bank of India did an IPO to and purchase was done by Nivedia. Say 100 shares, 300 each. She paid 30,000. What shares? Equity shares. Now SBA received 30,000. Question is, will it be subject to GST? You have to give me an answer on the chat box. Will it be subject to GST? No. Reason is supplying equity shares. Equity shares are, are they goods? Not goods. Are they services? Not services. Thereby, is it a supply? Not a supply. Thereby, will it be subject to GST? No GST. But what Nivedia did is, after two months, when the share prices became higher, Nivedia transferred that to Sonia. Sold this particular shares, 100 equity shares, she sold it. Why should Nivedia sell the share? Because she is getting a higher price. Each share she is getting 500. So 50,000. Question is now she is getting 50,000. Will this be subject to GST? No. Again, the same answer because she is supplying equity shares which are not goods, which are not services, which is not a supply. Thereby, this will not be subject to GST. But, but so that is also securities only. Equity shares are securities. This is also a security. And securities are neither goods nor services. It's not a supply nor GST. But, assume, can where, where, see, first after the IPO, where this transaction will happen, it will happen in stock market. So in stock market, will whether Nivedia will be able to directly contact Sonia and then do the transaction? The answer is no. So what Nivedia would have done is that Nivedia had approached for this transaction a broker called a Zeroda, which is a stock broker. Now, Zeroda has charged from Nivedia rupees 50 as commission. Now, whether this particular commission of 50 will that be subject to GST? Will that be subject to GST? The answer is yes. If that's the case, who's the supplier? Zeroda is the supplier. What is the what is the supply that Siroda is making? What is the term of that supply? They are doing facilitating transaction in security. Facilitating transaction in security. That is the activity and that will be treated as a service. So what is not a service? What is not a service? Sale of security which involves disposal of security which means that the ownership is changed. That is not a supply. But facilitating transaction in security is a service. Similarly, renting of security Or we can call it as lending. Lending of security on a rent. That is also a service because that does not involve disposal. I don't need to move my security from I into another. Okay, because there is another topic wherein you will have 
this confusion that can come. So when I sell my security, that is neither goods nor services, it's not a supply. But then when there is no disposal, that will become. So what is what is the meaning? What is the understanding that we have finally? What is neither goods nor services? What is neither goods nor services? If you analyze, you can understand that money when there is no separate consideration and securities are neither goods nor services there will not be any gst because it is not even a supply so one more question there will the when i'm calculating the turnover should i add the turnover relating to trading of security as my aggregate turnover the answer is no because aggregate turnover is the turnover which can which includes taxable supply exempted supply this is not even a supply so trading turnover and all will not be forming part of my aggregate turnover. Then second branch, what is the second branch says? They have used the word such as and they have given the activities like sale, transfer, barter, exchange, lease, license, rental or disposal. There is a meaning of the term such as. The meaning of the term such as is that whatever activity mentioned after the word such as what are the activities mentioned? There are eight activities mentioned. These are just an example of supply. Can there be ninth activity and still that be called a supply? The answer is yes. If that's the case, your logical question would be, if the ninth activity can also be a supply, what's the point in listing these eight activities in the act itself? Why should I, why should I do that? They said, throughout CGST Act, there are multiple places where I'll use the term sale where I'll use the term transfer. Stock transfer can be supply sometimes. Disposal can be supply sometimes. Lease can be supply sometimes. There will be times where I'll use the term exchange. So in all those cases, what is that I mean? I mean supply. So for that purpose, for that purpose, they have given few examples of supply inside the inside the section itself but a ninth activity can also be a supply and that is that particular meaning is given by using the term such as so in any act or any provision if you use the term such as and then you give certain items it only indicates the illustrative list or example list it's not an exhaustive list so a ninth activity can also be a supply that is the intention that is communicated so what are the cases where we have sale transfer sale has ownership transfer transfer can be even a stock transfer they're saying in some cases both of them can be supply barter it can be a supply exchange can be a supply lease can be a supply license rental disposal all of these are supplies next made or agreed to be made for consideration we should know that consideration is a very integral part of the definition can there be can there be supply if the transaction does not involve consideration? So the transaction or the activity has no consideration. Can it still be a supply? Generally, the answer is no. If there is no consideration, it is not a supply. Like you said, no charity and all that. If there is no consideration, it cannot be a supply. But, but there is an exception to it. There are certain activities which can be a supply even without consideration. What did we learn that? Transactions which are supply even without consideration. C is missing. That we have said no. Schedule 1. Correct. Section section 7, subsection 1, close C. 7.1 C, which says that activities in Schedule 1, which are only four activities, except that four activities, nothing else can be a supply without consideration. So, what's our general answer? General answer is very simple. It's not a supply if there is no consideration. But in some cases, like Schedule 1 activities, which are listed four of them, it can be a supply even without consideration, provided it is in the course of furtherance of business. Now, they have defined because of that, the definition of consideration is very important for us. Now, consideration can be in terms of money or otherwise for the supply. It even includes monetary value of any act or forbearance for the supply. What is consideration? It says consideration can be in terms of money or otherwise for the supply. It includes monetary value of any act or forbearance for the supply. It can be paid by recipient or any other person. It excludes subsidy received from central government, state government, security deposit which is unadjusted. 
this is the understanding we have okay, now let's try to discuss this consideration can be consideration in general understanding would have been something in return okay so they're saying that consideration can be in terms of money it can also be otherwise which means that non-monetary consideration also if you have it will still be treated as an activity with consideration say i provide a service and i'm getting cash that could be money and i provide audit services i'm getting some other services in return which would be consideration other than money it even includes monetary value of any act or forbearance for the supply i provided a service i did not get any money i did not get any services but they said they will not set up an office which is competing with me what is that they have decided they have decided to forbear for supply okay they said they will not do competition with me there is an agreement they signed an agreement saying that they will not do competition with me which means that it's, it has a monetary value what is that they have given in return forbearance not doing something sometimes not doing something can also have a monetary value so if they do that against my service then that will also be considered to be a service with consideration say i provided services to mr a but i got consideration from mr b will it still stand as consideration the answer is yes so consideration can be paid by a recipient or any other person but it excludes two things one is subsidy received from government second one is security deposit unadjusted let's take an example on security deposit Suppose I'm opening an academy. Okay, it's my YouTube channel. <laughs> so this particular uh, Limitless Learning, which is an entity, is planning to take a building on rent. Suppose our friend Abhijit has a building. It is given on rent. Monthly rent is one lakh. Apart from that, he is asking me to pay six months advance. So he is the supplier. What is the supply that he has made? Renting of immobile property. Consideration is monthly allowed to pay 1 lakh rent plus 6 lakh I have paid as advance. Security deposit. Question is whether this monthly rent is it subject to GST? Yes. Whether the 6 lakh is subject to GST? The answer is no. Because there is nothing that I am getting in return. This is just a security deposit. This is not a consideration. Not a consideration for anything. But last month, after one year, after one year, I decided I purchased my own uh, building to move my classes there. So one year after, what I am telling Abhijit is that I would like to vacate your building and um, I would like to move my own building. Now 6 lakh is the... 6 lakh is the advance that is already with him. So Abhijit said, see, last month the rent is pending. So I said, you adjust that rent and give me back only 5 lakh. So in the last month, he has adjusted 1 lakh. Did I pay last month 1 lakh? No. He has adjusted that 1 lakh against my 6 lakh deposit. Now, can Abhijit content? So Abhijit is contenting now that, see, I did not get any consideration on the last month rent. There was no consideration. Can I say it like that? No. Out of 6 lakh, how much is adjusted? 1 lakh. So how much will be the security deposit now? Only 5 lakh. So 1 lakh will be subject to GST. Only 5 lakh is the refundable deposit. This is not a consideration in that case. You guys with me? That is why they have written, it excludes subsidy received from government and security deposit unadjusted. Whatever is not adjusted is not a consideration. In the last month, whatever is adjusted becomes a consideration next 
they are saying that supply should be made by a taxable person. Supply should be made by a taxable person. Who is a taxable person? There is a definition on taxable person as well. A person who is registered or liable to be registered under section 22 or 24 of CGST Act 2017. Two things that they have mentioned here. Registered or liable to be registered. Either they are registered or they are liable to be registered. Both of them will make them a taxable person. Let's try to understand. What if they are not registered, they are not liable to be registered, they are not even a taxable person. So, I will give you two people, you tell me whether they are taxable person or not. This is Kohli, this is Mahendra Singh Dhoni, both of them are running restaurants, both of them are running biryani shops. Okay, suppose Kohli's turnover in uh, Delhi. Police turnover is 15 lakhs. Mahendra Singh Dhoni's turnover is only 5 lakhs. Suppose. What's the turnover limit? It's a service. What's the turnover limit in Delhi? 20 lakhs threshold limit. Whether Kohli is liable to register? No. No registration. He did not take a registration. Question is, is he a taxable person? Now, MSD is also there, only 5 lakh turnover, threshold limit is 20 lakh. So, 5 lakh is less than 20 lakhs. Whether whether he is liable to register? No. But he, what he did is that, he took voluntary registration. Can he take voluntary registration? That is allowed. If he wants, he can take voluntary registration. So he said, if I like, I'll still take registration. Who is a taxable person here? Is Mahendra Singh Dhoni a taxable person? Who is a taxable person here? So, Kohli, will he be a taxable person? No, because he is not registered. Is he liable to register? Not liable to register. So, both ways, he will not be a taxable person. So, Whatever supply that Kohli makes, there will not be any GST. But since he is voluntarily registered, MSD will become a taxable person, GST is payable. Look at it. The turnover is less for MSD, but then tax will be payable. Kohli has higher turnover, but no GST payable because he is not even registered. He is not a taxable person. So for me to call it as a supply, it has to be made by a taxable person. This is the understanding that we have. Now the understanding is, what if Kohli's turnover is 50 lakhs and he did not take registration, is he still a taxable person? Yes, because there he will be liable to take registration. So what happens when you take voluntary registration, the moment you take voluntary registration, you will be subject to GST, you might have to pay taxes there. Now the last branch. What is the last branch says? The supply should be in the course of furtherance of business. That's what it says. Supply should be in the course of furtherance of business. What is the meaning of that? Again, one more understanding that we can uh, make out of this is that if there is no business objective, if an activity is not in the course of furtherance of business, if an activity is not in the course of furtherance of business, question I have for you is, will that activity be a supply? Generally, when there is no business objective or it is not an activity which is in the course of furtherance of business in India, will it be a supply? The answer is no, because all the four conditions to be satisfied for an activity to be called as supply. But is there any special case where it can be a supply? If business and consideration is not there, no activity can ever be a supply. But business is not there, but consideration is there. Is there any activity that can be a supply? Yes, perfect. Importation of services with consideration can be a supply even without business object. Perfect, Sharan. Which means, except for this one activity in the entire country called as importation of services, no other activity can be a supply without business objective. So, business definition also has to be that strong. One thing that we can understand is, Second hand sale of personal product is not a business activity, it will not be a supply, which means that if I make an oil like sale, I have an old AC, I made a sale of that AC to someone. 
I did not purchase that AC for the purpose of selling. I am not running any businesses. So that activity will not be a supply. So this is some general understanding that you can take. ICA had de deferred in some of the thing. They have given confusing sentences like business definition says it can be a business even if I make one sale and all that. But then for our understanding, no. Second hand sale of personal product cannot be coming under business. It is not even a supply. Because you have not purchased the product for the purpose of selling. So all your oil X sale, not even a supply is the understanding you can take. Now, how the business is defined? This is the definition that we have for business. Very simple understanding is what we are going to do the approach. Okay, so I have div divided the business definition into seven categories. Okay. Seven category of definition that we have for business. Out of the seven category, only first two, two things, two branches are talking about what is business. Rest all the five branches are talking about specifically what activity can be a business for collecting GST, which means two things are generally talking about what is business. Then five of these branches are saying that these activities will be called as business because I wanted to collect GST. That simple it is. Are you guys with me? Now let's look at it. First, generally what is business? Any trade, commerce, manufacture, profession, vocation, etc. Trade, even services, commerce, manufacturing, profession, chartered accountants, cost accountants, everyone. Vocation, even a job, somebody came and did carpenting work, repair work, housekeeping work, all that can be called as a business activity. For monetary benefit or not, Generally, an activity will be done. Generally, an activity will be done for monetary benefit. But they saying business can be even without monetary benefit. If, if you're making sale with a loss, still it becomes a business activity. They are trying to be very sure that nobody escaped from GST. They should not go to the court and then contest it. Then it includes inc any incidental and ancillary activity to it, all related activities. If there is, if I'm running a manufacturing business, I also have a canteen run that also becomes a business activity because it is in relation to the business incidental activity. Now they are trying to defend. They're saying that you cannot escape from the, the definition of business. You cannot say that you are not doing business just because you are not having volume, continuity, frequency or regularity, but you're doing trade commerce or manufacturing or whatever it is. And you're saying that I don't have volume. I'm making only very less volume of sales. Like 50 sales in a year, I'm, I'm making only 50 kg sales, very less quantity. But then I said, no, volume is not a criteria. Continuity, I'm starting the business, closing for another six months, open it again. I have no continu continuity. It's okay, still you're doing business only. You're purchased for the purpose of selling or you're doing an activity which is involves commerce, you know. Then, frequency or regularity. It, no, it, it will not, you will not be able to escape from the business definition just because you're saying that you, you are making one sale in January, next sale happens in June. Does not matter. There is no requirement for you to have frequent trade or regular trade for you to call it as business. All of it is a business. Now, business definition use is used in two places. As you can see it in here, I've given. Business definition is relevant for supply as well as input tax credit. So some of the wordings here will be more relevant in case of input tax credit. Look at it. Supply or acquisition. When you are acquiring something, it is more of an ITC that you are trying to figure out. They're saying that business activity will include any supply or acquisition of goods, including capital goods you have done in relation to commencement of business. Whatever you purchased at the time of beginning of business or for beginning the business will also be a business activity. You will be able to take ITC. Similarly, when you're closing down the business, whatever is there with you as stock will be as good as supplied by you. This is what they're trying to tell. All these activities of stock at the time of closure and whatever purchase at the time of beginning, all of this will be considered to be a business activity. Then there are five activities which you we will read and then we'll try to understand what activity they are trying to collect GST here. First one. Provision of facility by club or association to its members for consideration. They are saying that membership fee will be subject to GST. So any club is providing an, uh, any, any, any facility to the member for consideration is a business activity. Similarly, 
tickets admission to admission for consideration to any premise you are entering into zoo you are entering into a cricket stadium you are entering into some uh, event you are entering into a music show all of this are business activities that entry ticket will be subject to gst then services as holder of an office accepted in the course of furtherance of business or uh, accepted in the course of furtherance of trade or profession like a chartered accountant is appointed as an independent director in a company you're holding the position of an independent director your sitting fee will be considered to be subject to gst for that they have said the activity of you being a director of in a in a company holding the office of director as a part of your profession is also considered to be a business activity then in a race club including by way of totalized setup license to bookmaker activities of a licensed bookmaker all these terms are you know we don't need to learn what exactly happens in a race club that will be a different discussion and you know a different kind of an approach towards learning things but you should understand the gst aspect of it earlier say myself and arjun arjun has just joined right so myself and arjun we two are uh, going into a bet so the activity that happens in a race club is a bet is on generally is given on a race horse now we both are giving bet for 10000 each before introduction of gst the G, uh, the service tax impact was on whoever is conducting the bet the club is conducting the bet whatever is the commission that they are they were collecting will be subject to taxes that was the earlier position now they want whatever bet amount you give full gst so if i give bet amount of 10000 the entire 10000 will be given to whom the club who's who's handling the bet now they're saying that entire 10000 will be subject to gst so for that they said whatever services provided by the club will be considered to be a business activity it could be even computation of bet whether i win or when i whether i don't win it is irrelevant it is so irrespective of that fact whether i win or i don't win it will be still subject to gst is the understanding that we need to make so the activity can be even a totalized setter computation of bet amount using the computer totalized setter or a bookmaker computes it whatever activity that the bookmaker does all that will be business activity similarly any activity by government or local authorities as public authority will also be considered to be a business activity this is where now government was given the power to exclude an activity done by government from supply definition are you guys clear so we are done with our section 71a which is the general definition of supply the examples are very important for us now generally we know all these four conditions satisfied all the definitions and all that we know what are what are the things that will be called as supply now in that we said consideration and business if both of them are missing nothing can be a supply but if one is there other one is not there then some of some cases it can be a supply in clause b we said importation of services the activity called as importation of services where supplier is outside india supplier is outside india and recipient is in india that can be a supply if it is for consideration whether for business or not for business still it can be called as a supply this is the provision that we have we will try to discuss it and we will try to create a 360 view understanding on how this transaction becomes a supply and if it becomes a supply who has to pay the taxes so we are discussing about importation of services the activity is import of service so supplier is outside recipient is in india the one who is in india is the recipient so for the government it is easy to catch this recipient because this fellow is in india for for taxability i have to ask the question is it as is it is happening for consideration or not for consideration if it is not for consideration this becomes a i have to do a schedule one check if it is for consideration then it could be in the course of furtherance of business
or not in the course of furtherance of business. If it is in the course of furtherance of business, which means that the recipient is a business entity. That means it is taxable. Who has to pay taxes? Reverse charge mechanism, recipient in India. Who is the recipient? Being business entity. They will pay taxes under RCA. This is there in IGST provision. Now, suppose the import of service is happening for consideration and recipient is not a business entity, which means that the recipient is taking that services in the course of it is not in the course of furtherance of business. First case, an example. First case, an example. Reliance Limited has taken services from a UK based company for their new building design. They are charging them 1 lakh dollars. Is it a supply? Yes. Is it import of service? Yes. Supplier is in UK. Recipient is Reliance in Mumbai. Who has to pay taxes? Reliance under what charge? Reverse charge. What if it's not in the course of furtherance of business? Mr. Ligil has taken the services. Mr. Ligil has taken the services for his personal purpose. For my, my own house, I wanted some interior design. Whether it becomes a supply. They said yes. It's a supply. Reason. Import of services does not require business objective the moment it has consideration. This is what is given by section 7.1b. But then you have a bigger problem there. Now the recipient happened to be, the recipient happened to be an individual. Can the government catch me and then ask me to pay taxes? No, right? Because the recipient here is, the recipient here is whom? Recipient is an person other than business entity. The moment is recipient is other than business entity. Mr. Ligil, an individual, I have taken a service from a UK based civil engineer firm to design my house. Can government ask me to pay taxes? I paid them one lakh dollars. Can they can the government ask me to pay taxes? That looks like no, because I have taken a service in India, but I'm an individual. How can I be asked to register and then pay taxes and all that? It will become very complicated structure, right? So they said if the services again they are classified is that service an OIGAR service is it other than OIGAR if it's an OIGAR service what is an OIGAR service we can for the time being I'm going to call it as online automated service Example, your Netflix. Reason, the service is done by a service supplier is outside India. It's an online automated service. Then it becomes taxable. Under what charge? Forward charge mechanism. Who has to pay? Supplier outside India. The government. So the government decided I'll ask the supplier outside India to pay taxes under forward charge if the recipient happened to be a person other than business entity and the services in relation to online automated service. So any other service that happens, it is exempted. Now it makes logic. So if I take a civil engineer services from outside India to India for my personal purpose, is it a supply? Is it a supply? The answer is yes, it's a supply. 
the moment it becomes a supply will it automatically all cases the moment it, it is import of service and it has consideration then we don't need to even think it's a supply sometimes question is only asked till then it's a supply or not but we have to ask one more question it's a supply but is it taxable if it's oidr services it is taxable if it's other than oidr services it is exempted is it clear if it is oidr like ott platforms and all that outside if it is oidr services the tax will be paid by that other person so if i'm subscribing to an online portal from outside i will pay gst also to them they will have to pay gst to them but if it is a business entity who is receiving services they will pay it now what is there in schedule 1 Schedule 1 has a separate activity which we will discuss later. Schedule 1 also has certain things relating to import of service. So import of services without consideration, if that activity is not a Schedule 1 activity, there will not be a GST because it will not become a supply. This is the understanding that we need to create. Now let's go back to our provision and then see. Section 7 b says importation of services for consideration in the course of furtherance of business or not in the course of furtherance of business will become a supply. But I'm giving you one more additional topic saying that if it is other than, if it is other than OIGR services, it is a supply, but it is not taxable, it is rather exempted. So what, why did they include this area of import of services? under uh, supply definition even without business objective in India. What is that they were eyeing at? They said, see, there are a lot of online services. The, the speciality of online services is that the supplier need not to be in India. They can be in US. They can be in San Francisco and then provide services to an Indian. That industry is crores and crores of worth. The government wants some contribution. So if the industry is 1000 crore worth, if there is 18% GST, government will get 180 crores. I mean, says, okay, that's something that has to come under the tax. You guys with me? So they decided. Then there was a question. What if the recipient is an uh, individual, not registered, other than business entity? How will I make it taxable? They said, okay, we will say that import of services does not require business objective in India to be called a supply. What if, if, if that's the case, every services will become taxable, no? Then they said, no, no, other than OIDR will give exemption. This is how they have decided it. That's the structure. Subscribe to LearnCab and hit the bell icon to get notified.